Luke chapter 10, verse 25. The parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we come and look at this very familiar passage, it will really help you if it keeps you open, uh, if you keep it open in front of it, and you open as well. Um, and uh, as we look at it, let me just ask you a question. In, in fact, if you're, if you're not a Christian here yet, just, just listen in the background for a moment. Okay, if you're a Christian, why are you here? Okay? Why are you here? Boys, can we just turn me down a little bit so I sound less like God and more like me? Um, why are you here? Now, now, you could, of course, say, well, I, I'm, I'm here, James, because I'm always here. You know, 11 o'clock on a Sunday, I'm here. That's what I do. I, I come to be here. Okay. Um, so why are you here? You, you, maybe because you're always here. But why are you here? And perhaps you say, well, I'm, I'm here, James, because I've, I've come to worship God. Great. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I, I'm not going to tell you not to come here, by the way. Um, but why are you here? Well, you perhaps you say, well, I, I've come so that I, I can sing songs together w with my friend. I can listen to, uh, be taught. I, I can be nourished. I, I can be filled up for the week ahead. I, I can just receive. Great. But why are you here? And you say, well... And I say to you, well, you could do that from the comfort of your own home. You know, hello, look, people on live stream. They're enjoying all of that, and they haven't come here. Why are you here? And you say, well, um, uh, my children go to the groups. They can't do that at home. Yes, you're right. Um, uh, I like to catch up with a few friends. Okay, 
Why are you here? Why don't you do that somewhere else? And you say, James, stop with the interrogation. But why are you here? See, because as we come and look at this little passage, I want to phrase it to you differently. How many of you are staying on for the community barbecue? Or actually, that's too much today. I've got other things to do, other people to see. You see, the clues in the title, it's a barbecue for the community. It's in fact aimed at people that probably most of us don't even know. Why are you going to come to that? Because as we come to this passage that you know and I know really well, Christian, Jesus has got something of a sting in the tail for us. He says, if you do not love your neighbor freely, you do not love God. Yes, you can come and hang out in my building in a service. You can sing great praise. You can hear teaching from me. But if you will not love your neighbor, you do not love me. Now, perhaps like me, in my heart, as I read that, I started to jump to a different place. Oh, Jesus, don't you know all the times and places I do all this stuff for all these people? Come on. Start to justify myself. But let me put it another way. Anthony and Jackie um, lock up the building every time after our services. Could you imagine a situation where come two o'clock, they were saying, I'm really sorry, but could you leave the building, everybody, because we've got to go home. Could you imagine a situation where Bill didn't say hello to you and welcome you in and give you a notice sheet, but everybody welcomed one another. The, the welcome team was redundant. Could you imagine a church family where the pastoral support team was, I don't know what that does, because we just love and care for each other. Where the queue for signing up to serve with the children, the AV or lunch club, was longer than the queue for the coffee and biscuits. Where we didn't have to have eight weeks of Passion for Life trying to help people hear about Jesus because you and I were so contagious, so outrageous to our friends with the way that we loved and treated other people. They'd be like, what's in the water at Holy Trinity? I just want to find out some more. See, this passage is going to make us think, do we really love our neighbor freely? Or do we pick and choose? Do we leave people out? Because the requirement of this passage that Jesus gives to this Jewish lawyer, this Jewish expert, when he comes and asks him the question, is right there in verse 27. If you've got your Bible, do have a look. Here's what the Christian is to do, one that follows Jesus. Verse 27, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus said. Do this and you will live. This, this is what the follower of Jesus is to do. To love him with all their heart and mind and love their neighbor as themselves. To love God and to love other people with me in the middle. Both of them tied together. They're what the Ten Commandments did. Commandments 1 to 4, to love God. Commandments 5 to 10, to love my neighbor as myself. That's what he's always been saying. That's what we're to do. But this... Jewish expert, this Jewish lawyer, isn't quite happy. He's not, he doesn't go, great, thank you so much, I'm going to go off and do that. You see, because Jesus wants him then and you, I, to follow, uh, sorry, to love God and to love our neighbor. Um, guys, that matter, if we can press, there are some things on the screen, if we could press through, that would be, there we go, brilliant. To love God and to love our neighbor. But as we come and meet this man, he's going to start to see, look, do you see verse 29? Uh, so Jesus, um, can I just clarify, who is my neighbor? <laughs> it's like the, the children is, that you've asked them to tidy up. How much do you want me to tidy up? How much should it be in the drawers? Or how much can I just leave for another day that will never be in the, in the future? Can I just clarify? He's not content with knowing because here's what Jesus' followers don't do. They don't say, I've got this right. Next one, please, boys. They don't say, I've got this right. Because that's what this guy does, doesn't he? Because uh, look, Jesus sees his heart, verse 29. He wanted to justify himself. It's a funny word, isn't it? But you and I know that's the case, isn't it? 
We know we justify ourselves as we're driving through um, those, uh, those speed zones and you get those nice um, speed cameras that tell you if you're under 30, you get a green smiley face and if you're over 30, you get a red sm- uh, unhappy face. Mm. And you're driving, at th- uh, you're driving along and it says 31, unhappy face. And you look at your speedo and say, I am doing 29, your speedo's wrong. That's justifying ourselves. Or when someone says, in your family, you didn't do, and you say, well, hang on a minute, let me just pull out my scroll of times that I have done. Look at these times I've taken out the bins. Look at these times I've bought you a birthday present. To justify myself is to say, no, 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 I've got it right. I've got it right. And here's this man trying to justify himself. Look, Jesus, can I just check? Who is my neighbor? Can we just make sure that the kind of people I think should be in that circle of who I love are in there? You're not going to mention the really outrageous people, the terrorist, or you're not going to mention those really sinful, horrible people. You're not going to ask those things. Can I just make sure we understand, please, Jesus? When we see a command like, love your neighbor as yourself, your head and your heart perhaps jump to, oh, well, that can't mean them. You know, and I couldn't possibly do everybody in the entire world. Well, no, you couldn't. But there's a six-foot radius around you of every person you meet. Love your neighbor. That's the person who comes in to that six-foot space as yourself. Do we do that with our love of other people? You know, it can't possibly mean them. They're too awkward. They'll take too much of my time. Surely not them. I find myself doing it so often with other people. I, I find myself doing it like with, as I walk past the homeless man or woman on the street. Like, I, I know the truth that if I put money in that pot, yes, it could lead to something that may not be helpful for them of drink and drugs or whatever it may be. But actually, I think I start justifying myself that I shouldn't love them because that could lead to that. Whereas actually the five-minute conversation... Do you want some lunch? I don't go to that level. You see, this man, his problem is his heart. He doesn't want to love his neighbor as himself. He wants to make sure he's done the right thing. That he'll be seen to have got it right. Do you know that? Perhaps with the one that you love or, you know, did you notice I did the washing up? Yes. We want to make sure we're okay. Why? Not for the benefit of them, but for the benefit of us. To know that I have got it right. You see, the problem with this young man as he comes and asks of Jesus is his heart is proud. Push it to another level. He wants to be God. He wants to make sure that this command Jesus gives, he's got control over. But followers of Jesus don't do that. Nor, secondly, do they say, I can't do that. Next one, please, Royce. Because as he starts to tell this story, um, we start to meet these three characters, don't we? He tells this story of a man walking along the road. It's a pretty treacherous road. Um, I think probably as treacherous as I could get, and apologies if you live in Croydon, is walking down the high street of Croydon at the dark of night. It's possibly as dangerous as that. Um, It's a place where it's going to be up and down, and it's going to be real effort. And surprise, surprise, this man walks this road, he's robbed, and he's left for dead. The question is now, who's going to help him? And here comes the first one. The priest, ah yes, the man that loves God with all his heart. Surely he'll do this, won't he? What does he do? He doesn't just not do it. He walks on the other side. He walks away. He says, I can't do that. And perhaps my, my shift at the temple is about to start. I need to go. Whether, I, I, you know, I, I can't go near, as some of the Old Testament laws, an unclean dead body. Perhaps that's what he was thinking. But he can't do it, can he? He's the ultimate spiritual man, the vicar of his day, and he can't do it. What about the Levite, the church warden of his day, the one that served in the temple, the one that that perhaps didn't have the otherness of the priest? He was more like normal people. Surely he'll get it. What does he do? 
32. Verse 32. When he came to the place and saw him, passes by on the other side. I can't do that. Whether for both of them it's too great, whether it's too costly, whether it's too much of an inconvenience, whether it's I'm too busy, they can't do it. They don't want to do it. Yeah, if he was asking to tie his shoelace, maybe, but to help a man that is practically dead, no chance. Do you find yourself doing that, friends? Can't do that with them. It's too hard work. Can't do that. Why would I want to do that? But you see, just like the expert in the law, the same problem is that we decide how much love we give and to whom. We think we know better than Jesus when he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. We want to say, well, love to that point. If they're a friend or a family, well, then I'll love them. If they're like me, then I'll love them. Or if I'll get something in return, then I'll love them. Well, there's none of that, is there? Love your neighbor as yourself. It's not loving like loving God and loving neighbor isn't saying I can't do that. Instead, it is saying, here's the third character, here's the good Samaritan. They say, I'll love you sacrificially. Because what walks on stage now is potentially the equivalent of a multi-murderer who served life sentence. The Jew of his day wouldn't have expected this person to have done this. But look what they do. Verse 33, a Samaritan as he traveled came rather than on the other side to where the man was. See, all of them had seen and heard But this man felt and moved. He moved towards him. He moved over towards him. He took pity on him. Literally, his heart was melted. He had a love for him. And that love starts to come out in action, doesn't he? He bandaged his wounds, which, by the way, he wasn't carrying a first aid kit, so he just whacked out a sort of big bandage to do it. It probably meant tearing his own clothes and garment to make it of of him. Potentially bringing own shame of partially torn clothing on himself. And, and then he gives, like, what I can think only now is the um, equivalent of lobster thermidor caviar and champagne. He pours on him the very best ingredients to help make him better. And by the way, I don't think doctors that, that necessarily lobster thermidor caviar and champagne will make you things better, but it helps us see how costly it is. Then he puts the man on his own donkey that he's got. And rather than him enjoy a gentle ride home, well, he has to walk. He gives up something and he takes on another burden. And then he takes him to a place where he cares for him. And then he pays the innkeeper to care for him, not just the next day. But do you see, he took silver coins, verse 35, and he gave it to the innkeeper saying, look after him. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. This isn't just an in the moment, two P in the pot. This is a generous sacrificial gift that's going to stretch on into the future as long as this man needs. Wow, that's a love, isn't it? A love that you and I, wouldn't you love to receive that? As this man receives it, imagine what he must have thought. His heart overwhelmed that this man who he didn't know would love him like that. That's how Jesus wants this lawyer to love. This is how he wants you and I to love. Because when we love our neighbor as ourself like that, we love God. It is an act of worship. So do you see that in you, dear friend? Is that your... Treatment of others? I bet it's not. It's not me. And that's precisely the point Jesus is trying to make to you and I. Because look again at verse 25, what this man is asking for. Verse 25, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
Well, what must I do to have a relationship with you, Jesus, that goes on in, through life into eternity? What must I do? And by the end of the story, what must he do? He can't do it. He can't do it. Because here's what him then and us need to realize. Here's it comes. We need to realize we don't love God and others. Of course, if you press down one more, it should be an... Oh, next one. Oh, keep going. Down. There we go. That we don't love God and neighbor. Do this and live, Jesus says. He can't do it. So he can't live. He can't have eternal life. It's the point, isn't it? You see, what this lawyer needed wasn't more information, more clarity. No, no, he, he needs a heart of love. He doesn't need new knowledge. He needs a new beat to pump blood around his body, to have compassion on others. You see, in this story, as we look at it, we don't see us We cannot love God and others like this. We don't. So who are we in this story? Would you know who we are? We're in it. We're the non-speaking part. The man that's lying half dead on the road. You see, Jesus tells this story longing that this man would realize that that is him. His heart is dead He's lost in the barren wastelands. Jesus has come to seek and save the lost. He's all by himself. And without intervention, well, then he cannot enjoy eternal life. But the amazing thing is that you and I have a good Samaritan, one beyond a story, because what does Jesus come and do? He comes out to find those who are dead in their transgressions. Ephesians chapter 2, and he, we saw, doesn't he, makes us alive in Christ. He takes his clothes, as it were, he bandages up his wounds. By his wounds we are healed. He pours oil and wine upon us. He even pours his own blood. So that in the words of Revelation, you and I are washed clean from our uncleanness. He puts us not just on a proverbial donkey, holds us up as his precious children. And then he takes us and he keeps us in this wonderful picture. He gives what we need in the moment, tomorrow, and throughout the rest of our days. You see, what you and I need to realize is that Jesus has come to love us with this outrageous love. He's come to love God with all his heart. He's come to love us, his neighbor, as himself, as he is our good Samaritan. Friend, if you're not a Christian here today, Christians aren't better than you. They're just as like you. And all of us need to realize that this is what Jesus offers. He offers to shower you with his love. He offers to do the reverse of what this lawyer wanted to do. Here we go. He, he wants to make you right. Not you make yourself right. He wants to justify you so that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Here's the next one. He comes to do it for them. He, he comes to love God and love neighbor for you. And he comes to love us sacrificially. He comes to love you. Perhaps you're here and you're a Christian here today, but you wonder whether actually you had any desire to love God and love neighbor. Have you ever realized this of yourself, that you don't? All a Christian is is someone that said, yes, please, Jesus. I receive it from you. Is that what you need to do today? Because when we do that, dear friends, you and I can actually do what Jesus wanted this man to do. Because when we receive his love from us, here's the third thing. Right down to the next one, boys. Last, last screen. Next one, sorry. There we go. As Jesus' loved followers, we can be set free to love God and our neighbor. 
You see, as, our, as loved followers, as we receive his love from others, we can go and give it to others without trying to justify ourselves, without limits that we might impose of them, but not them. Oh, we'll do that, but not that. We can just love freely, whoever it may be. We can love sacrificially because we have been loved. We can love with an outrageous love. Friends, the Lord Jesus has set you free through pouring his love upon you to be the good Samaritan. You imagine how as those 72 that we saw last week were sent out to go and speak about Jesus. Can you see how this would go side by side as they love their neighbor as themselves, as they both spoke it and lived this gospel message? That's what you and I have the privilege of doing, dear friends. We're to go and love freely, not conditionally. We're to go and love limitlessly, not with limits. We're to go and do what Jesus has done so that others may see and hear and experience the grace and love of God. You imagine what, how that may transform the spaces and places you go. If it is the homeless man or woman in the street, stopping your busy schedule to make time for them. Do you know the number of people that run past them each day? You stopped. Perhaps made them a, bought them a cup of coffee. You imagine at, at work, r- rather than just meeting your deadlines, but actually having time for your colleagues, speaking to your colleague that is quiet and nobody else speaks to. You imagine your home... So when your eldest son comes and says, Dad, please, could you play wicket-keeping in the garden? You love him rather than through gritted teeth, but with joy in your heart. I'd love to, even though there's a cost. Imagine what it would be like for us as a church family, where we loved one another with a joy-filled love. We helped one another experience the love of the Lord Jesus as we loved one another. Not just a few, not just on my terms, not just on the occasional time I'm on a rotor, but without limits, without conditions, like Jesus himself, as we receive it from him. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have loved us whilst we were dead in our sins and transgressions. You have poured upon us the grace and love that we did not deserve. So, Father, we pray. Help us to receive that and help us to be those that live it out, loving our neighbours as ourselves, as we love you with all our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.